needs, who needs a physician? Interesting question in the world in which we live today, at which physicians are certainly at the top of the food chain when it comes to helping humans with their problems. If you have physical problems, you go to a physician. If you have other problems, you go to a physician. If you have mental problems, you go to a physician. If you have stress problems, you go to a physician. They are endowed with an immense amount of power in our society today. Now, I have great respect for physicians. Great respect for physicians. <laughs> I heard one say yesterday, she has one child, and she said the parenting one child has been harder than med school. And I thought, you must forget med school quickly. <laughs> I, parenting is hard, but... I want to ask the question this morning, does God understand addictions? The assumption in our culture is that your physician is supposed to understand addi addictions. Jesus claims to be a physician. Does God understand addictions? You might say, Pastor, that is a boring sermon title because I already know the answer. But there are two reasons why we should ask the question. First, many people think that modern science has demonstrated that addictions are diseases. The Bible says that drunkenness is a sin, but science has shown that drunkenness is a disease, therefore the Bible is outdated. God is outdated. He doesn't understand addictions like um, brilliant modern people like us understand them today. So that's one reason. Another, But even though you might not say that, you probably all, we have probably all felt at times that um, Maybe God doesn't understand how hard this is for us. You know, maybe God doesn't understand how badly we try to change or try to obey and it just doesn't happen. Or does God really understand how out of control we can feel? So for both of those reasons, I want to address this question, does God understand addictions? Let's pause for just a minute and pray. Father, I pray that you might give to the preacher this morning humble trust in you that I might simply trust you and I pray that you might give to the hearers hope hope because you grant to them the gift of faith and as they are reminded about who you are and who Jesus is this morning by your good gifts something in their heart might rise up and say I, I want to seek Jesus I want to trust Jesus so I pray that you might Stir hearts toward your son. Lift him up this morning. Give faith. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we began this study about the sins of control. We noted that any sin could be understood as a sin of control, but we're focusing especially on those things that appeal to our bodies very directly or those things that seem to especially make us feel like we aren't really in control. Maybe those things that are especially addictive um, the things that make us feel like saying, I hate it, but I keep going back to it, or I can't stop, or I can't help it. Those are the kinds of things we're talking about. Last week, we looked at a, just kind of a general overview of this from the Bible, and then we ended up with the theme of Jesus as Lord. We said that in the midst of the story of humanity, where so much seems out of control, there is a living Lord who sets captives free, who says to out-of-control people, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is talking there about a kind of control, a yoke that is a blessing. The sins of control are different. They're yokes too, just not the kind that are a blessing. We want to use things for our own pleasure and then those things use us. We want to control things to satisfy our desires, but those things control us. And so here's the question I want to ask, does God understand? Does God understand what detox is like, how strong cravings can feel, how vicious the cycle can be? Does God understand that feeling of I can't help it? Let's begin with Proverbs 23. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has 
needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights and your mind imagine confusing things. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? If those verses form the entirety of what the Bible said about addictions, I think we would still be able to see that God understands. This is a 3,000-year-old portrayal that nearly every American today would recognize immediately. Either they would say, yes, I've experienced that, or they would say, yes, that's just what my dad or my mom or my brother or my friend or my boss is like. Strife of damaged relationships, we see that here, right? Conflicts, complaints, needless bruises from falls or fights, bloodshot eyes, not being able to think straight, getting confused, doing things that don't make any sense, like sleeping on top of the rigging of your ship, things that are dangerous, hating alcohol yet cherishing it like a lover and craving it all over again. Now that description is about alcohol, but it could apply to so many other things. Take video games, for example. A young man might play his video games late into the night, He ignores other relationships to keep up the relationship with his friends online. He forgets to eat or he just munches junk food while he plays. He doesn't exercise, so he's getting very unhealthy. But he's also staying up really late because you've got to finish and you can't let down your friends and you're in different time zones and whatever. He's staying up really late. He's not getting enough sleep. He's not getting to work on time. He's not doing his job well. Maybe he's already lost one job. He's gotten a warning at his new job. His girlfriend told him to choose between her or his games. He hates his video games, yet he loves them. Can't wait to get home from work and do it again. It's not just young men today. Or how about something as simple as worry? It makes you feel sick. I'm worried sick, we say. It can make you literally sick. It can rob you hour after hour of sleep. It accomplishes Nothing. Yet, it feels like a drug you've got to come back to. I hate worry. I know it's sin, and I'm determined to stop. And, oh, I look forward to worrying. It feels good. Instead of alcohol or video games or worry, we could just, what if we just put a blank and let each person fill it in for himself or herself? How many Americans would be able to put something in that blank and say that they understand? Or how many people would say that they have some understanding of what the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote nearly 2,000 years ago in Romans 7, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good that I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Do you understand that? The statement in Galatians 5, look at the words this ends with. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. You do not do what you want. That applies to every person. This is not just about addicts in a formal sense. We all understand what this is like. In, every, in this sense, every human being is out of control in our sin. And just these three passages we've looked at, Proverbs 23, Romans 7, Galatians 5, show us that God certainly knows about our struggle. His word is full of relevance for each one of us as we struggle with the sins of control. The next question is, how can we explain this? You, you need to see this morning that there's something kind of absurd here. There's something absurd in the words, I don't do what I want to do. Do you see the absurdity there? If I walk up to someone sitting on his porch and he says to me, I want to go inside and eat breakfast. Well, first of all, that's a little odd, isn't it? That he just said to me, I want to do this, but you're sitting here on the porch. 
And if I say to him, well, why don't you go inside and eat breakfast? He says, I don't know. I say, do you have legs that can walk? Yes. Is there food inside for you to eat breakfast? Yes. Do you have enough strength to get up? Yes. Is the door unlocked? Yes. Okay, you want to go inside and eat breakfast. I'm missing something. <laughs> Something's not connecting here. Get up, go inside, eat breakfast. Do you understand what I'm saying? Isn't there something absurd about human beings saying, I don't do what I want to do and I do what I don't want to do? Do we not live in the land of the free and the home of the brave? Now, free and brave people do what they want to do, right? They don't say, uh, I want to do this, but I, I, I don't do what I want to do and I don't want to do that, but I do what I don't want to do. Something strange is going on. How do we explain this? How is it that human beings struggle to have control over their lives? Well, let's consider some answers. Maybe the reason is nurture or environment. Maybe our dear man on the porch has a wind blowing so strongly that he can't get up out of his chair into the door. How about that? Now, does, does nurture, does environment affect people? Children who grow up in a home with alcoholic parents, even if they are not biologically related to those parents, are more likely to end up being alcoholics themselves. Young people whose siblings are drug users are more likely to become drug users, even if they're not biologically related to those siblings. People who had fun drinking when they were younger are more likely to drink when they're older. That's all pretty obvious, right? Human beings are impressionable. We may feel free and brave, but we are deeply affected by those around us. As a matter of fact, I want you to know how free and brave I am. Isn't that a little ironic? I want you to see that I don't do what anybody tells me to do. I'm not at anybody's mercy. I do what I want to do. And you noticed that, right? <laughs> I'm at your mercy to notice how free I am from what you think of me. And that's why, as we saw last Sunday, that the Bible warns about companionship with people who don't have self-control. Because he who walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools is going to suffer harm or be destroyed. Proverbs 13, 20. We're, we are deeply affected by other people. Not just that, we're also affected by our circumstances. People under stress are more likely to drink than people who aren't under stress. <laughs> Again, it's so obvious, right? During times of great celebration, during times of great heartache, it's easy to turn to sins that can take control. So does nurture, does environment have something to do with why life seems out of control for people sometimes? Yes, it does. Another factor is the human body. The dominant trend in culture and in science today is to connect addictions to the body, and there is no doubt a connection. For example, physical addictions can be very real. Your body gets used to a certain um, level of a substance in your blood and you have physical cravings for that substance. And if you don't have that level of the substance in your blood, your body goes bonkers and feels really, really terrible. And it can be dangerous and in extreme situations, even deadly. Beyond this, there is plenty of evidence, and this is what all the headlines are today, there is plenty of evidence that there are genetic factors involved, that there are genetic markers that indicate a higher probability a person will become an alcoholic or other related things. And so as a result of those things, the trend today is to use the term disease to describe alcoholism and many other sins of control. Now, the Bible definitely agrees that the body is a factor in the sins of control. After all, the Bible teaches that God created mankind to consist of both body and soul intertwined together. It is not normal for body and soul to be separated. The point of resurrection is so that you will have a body joined together in oneness with your soul for all of eternity. So body and soul are, are intertwined in God's purposes and God created our bodies with desires. The same desires that are twisted and distorted by the sins of control. Satan even tried to take advantage of the human body of Jesus when he tempted him during a time of great hunger, right? Satan was not ignoring his body. 
And so, uh, and, and we can also say that it makes a lot of sense that the human genome would be damaged by the curse and that human genetics are not getting better <laughs> as time goes by. That just makes sense and that's what the science also shows. So the body is a factor just as much as nurture or environment. But now the question is, do those two factors explain everything? Can the human tendency to lose control be completely explained by environment and body, by nurture and biology? And the answer is no, not at all. Consider nurture. How many people from terrible homes never do the things that their parents did? How do you explain that? How many people from deep pro poverty grow up to be wealthy? How many children of alcoholics never drink? How many children of very unhealthy parents grow up to be obsessive about their own health? In the Bible, you have stories of godless kings of Israel whose children were godly. You have somebody like Joseph who has all these brothers with no character and he has all this character. I explain that. How do you explain someone like Joseph or Daniel who lives for decades in a completely pagan environment? Parents, you're trying to protect your kids. You're trying to guard them from negative influences. You would not put them in Babylon. You would not put them in Egypt. And yet these men lived pure, faithful lives decade after decade after decade in pagan places. How do you explain that? If nurture is what determines who we are. Nurture is a factor, but it does not cause the sins of control. Okay, so then consider the body. All the headlines are about the genetic connections. There are genetic markers that indicate a higher risk of alcoholism. What about all the people with the genetic markers who never become alcoholics? It is not a cause. Might it be an influence? Yes. Is it a cause? No, not at all. Praise the Lord. And so the disease model of addictions, which is the dominant model in common thinking today, it fails as a thorough explanation. Yes, diseases are connected to the body. Yes, I mean, I mean yes, addictions are connected to the body. Yes, addictions share some similarity with diseases. But it is extremely naive to put alcoholism and cancer in the same category. Al addictions do not at all fit the definition, the standard definitions of a disease. They're not technically diseases. You don't test for and verify an addiction like you test for and verify other diseases. You don't get an addiction in the same way that you get other diseases. And you aren't cured from an addiction in the same way that you are cured from other diseases. So if we're asking the question, how can we explain why human beings tend to lose control of their lives? We could say nurture, and there's truth to that, Bible truth to that, but it's not a complete answer. It's not a cause. We could say the body, and there will be truth to that, Bible truth to that. And we could say it's like a disease, and there would be some truth to that. But the, to explain the sins of control as a disease is going to fall woefully short. To go any deeper, we're going to have to turn to God for answers. Okay, now remember, I know I've said this like three times already, but it just, this is so commonly used against us. Remember, nurture and biology are both Bible answers too. We're not saying here are the science answers and here are the Bible answers. We're saying these are all Bible answers. But science and uh, godless culture will only take those first two answers. They don't want any of the other answers from God. So what other factors though would God suggest, teach, instruct us about. There are three of them. They weave together carefully. They're not really that separate. Um, first of all is sin. Romans 6, 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. You were, Romans 6, slaves of sin. John 8, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Proverbs 5, the iniquities of the wicked ensnare him and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. Now, if someone doesn't believe in sin, then they don't have any interest in any of that. But if you believe there is such a thing as sin, 
then what these verses describe probably corresponds to your actual experience. Have you ever experienced anything that made you feel like when you sin, it's kind of like a rope wraps around you? And when you sin again, it's kind of like a rope wraps around you again? And it gets a little tighter? Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever felt like it gets harder to stop and more difficult to break loose from a habit the more you do it? The more you give into a sin? There is something about sin that does seem to take a life on of its own. Do you see that in those verses? It's describing sin almost like it's a, thi- like it's a thing or a person. And one of the reasons why that's interesting is if you hear an alcoholic talk about the bottle, they'll describe that bottle just like it's a living thing, a person, a lover. The Bible describes sin kind of like that, almost as if it takes on a life of its own. So how do we explain the fact that so many people feel like they aren't completely in control? Part of the answer is nurture, part of the answer is our bodies, another part of the answer is sin. All human beings reject God's way, take our own way, and our own way is addictive. Sin is addictive. I know this is kind of gross, but that's the point. Sin is like a tick or like a fish hook. It goes into your skin easily. It does not come out of your skin easily. And the deeper it goes in, the more nasty it's going to be to get it back out. We get hooked by sin very easily. We do not get unhooked easily at all. Another part of the biblical explanation is Satan. Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. If you're taking notes, you could underline some words in there. Rulers, powers, forces, forces. Aren't those all lordship words? Aren't those all control words? You could write it in there right beside Ephesians 6. Control. And there's another word used for Satan that goes even further. What's the ultimate control word that's used for Satan? God (laughs) calls him the God of this world. Not God in the ultimate sense. But boy, there's a control word for you. And so Ephesians 2.2 says, You formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Okay, so you formerly walked according to him, according to the prince of the power of that spiritual realm of darkness. Now, what does that mean? We don't say that quite in normal English. Like, we don't say you walked according to him. So what does it mean here? What if we say that, that, that NASCAR driver, he drove that race according to the strategy from his crew chief? What do we mean then? Instead of, at all those key moments in the race when he thought, you know, my crew chief doesn't know what he's talking about. I got a better idea. Instead of doing that, he kept with the strategy from the crew chief for the whole race. He, he drove according to the strategy from his crew chief. So he, he let someone else have control. Okay, so what does it mean to walk according to the prince of the power of the air? New Living Translation, you used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan. Good News Translation, you obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers. The CEV, you followed the ways of the world and obeyed the devil. That's just what it's saying. And so 1 John 5, 19 says that the whole world lies in the power, the control of the evil one. And he is a destroyer. Remember the rollerblading? I I was reminded afterwards I'm supposed to call it inline skating. My apologies to any of you who are inline skaters that I called you rollerbladers last week. Remember the inline skating illustration last week? Remember the half marathoners drud- pulling themselves across the finish line and these guys flying by at 30 miles an hour with no brakes, risking some serious 
collisions that could have done some major damage. Well, destroyers like damage. Some of you have boys. And they like video games with cars that crash into other things as hard as possible and send things flying as far as possible. All right, that's fun for boys. For Satan, it's more than fun. It is his mode of operation. Destroy. So what does he think about people who are out of control? Beautiful, beautiful. What does he think about something like 20 million Americans who are either already addicted to alcohol or are binge drinkers in such a way that they are headed toward it? What does he think? 20 million. 20 million people who are going 30 miles an hour with no brakes and plowing people over in the process. Does he have anything to do with that? Nurture, yes. Biology, yes. Sin, yes. Satan, yes. And finally, number five, the human heart. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. There's the disease model. Is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Which means, who really understands how bad the human heart is? All right, let's back up and make sure we have the right perspective on this. Back up to the very good beginning when God created Adam and Eve and everything was the way it was supposed to be. Back then, did Adam and Eve have desires? Were Adam and Eve little Buddhas? Mm. Or did they have desires? Did Adam and Eve get up in the morning and want to have fun? Did they want pleasure? Did they want comfort? Did they want happiness? Did they want acceptance? What's a drug addict looking for when he finds his next whatever fix? Is he looking for physical pleasure? Who made our bodies to experience physical pleasure? God. Is the addict looking for peace? Is he looking for a feeling of happiness? Is he trying to forget about his troubles? Well, in the very good creation, the way things are supposed to be, you have peace and you don't think about any of your troubles because you don't have any. That's the way God intends things to be. Is the addict looking for acceptance? Is he partly partaking in these drugs or whatever, because it's what his peer group is doing? Well, who created us to crave acceptance? God? So Christianity does not teach that desires are bad. Buddhism teaches that desires are bad. (laughs) Buddhism teaches that you must let go of your desires. Good luck. All you can do is let go of some desires and replace them with the desire to let go of your desires. Christianity does not teach that desires are bad. So, but then look back at Jeremiah 17, 9. If we're not saying that desires are bad, what does it mean when it says the heart is desperately sick? If it's not the desires themselves that are bad because they come at the root from God, what about the human heart is so sick? It's this. It's that we take our desires, which came from the Creator, and we completely reject the Creator's teaching about how to fulfill those desires. We decide that when the Creator says, fulfill that desire like this and not like this, we can just ignore Him and do whatever we want. That is sick. (laughs) This past February, one of the world's newest cruise ships, 150 feet longer than the biggest aircraft carriers in the Navy. Sailed right into the middle of what ended up being an Atlantic hurricane. Passengers were terrified. Some people were injured. There were all these videos posted online of furniture flying all over the place. The ship sustained major damage. And now cruise ships sometimes get caught in storms. That's the nature of life on the ocean. But this storm had been clearly predicted all week And what do you think the manufacturer of the cruise ship would have said about taking that cruise ship into 100 mile an hour winds? He would have said, that ship's not made for that. Don't take that ship there. And so despite that, despite the warnings from the ship manufacturer, despite the warnings from the weather forecasters, for a reason I don't don't know, the captain waited too long to try to turn the ship. 
And when he tried to turn the ship, the winds were too strong and he didn't have our word. What's our word we're talking about? Control. He didn't have control any longer. You can't ignore the manufacturer's warnings. What if we what if we went up to the captain of that cruise ship and asked him, Why are you ignoring the way this ship was made and sailing right into a hurricane? And what if he said, I just want to be free? Don't worry, be happy, man. I don't need any dumb ship manufacturer telling me what to do. We're just going to go have some fun together, me and these 4,000 people who paid to be on my boat. Let me guess, you're one of those boring rule-keeping people who reads the manual for everything. Not me. I want to have freedom. Now, what would we say about that? We would say, that man is sick and needs to be arrested. He has 4,000 people on that boat. You don't do that. Yet that is the attitude that the world lives life with and applauds and says is good. Why is let it go running through my head right now? (laughs) Because we watched Frozen yesterday again. At least I'm honest. Come on. (laughs) Love that movie. Hate that song. The default attitude of every human heart is, I want to be free. I don't want any God telling me what to do. I'm going to have some fun I'm not going to be one of those boring people who try to follow the rules. I want my freedom. That is your greatest disease. So now we can see the full biblical perspective. Why do human beings struggle so greatly to have control over their lives? Nurture? Yes. We are deeply influenced by our environment. Bodies? Yes. Our bodies can both give us tendencies towards certain things and then become physically addicted to those things. Sin, yes. Sin takes slaves. It goes in easily but only comes out with great difficulty. Satan, yes. He is a destroyer who is a lord, a master over every person who lives in sin. And then finally, the human heart, yes. It is sick. Thinking that we can reject the creator's way and satisfy our desires however we want. In every sin of control, you will find some influence from all five of those factors. Every sin, all five factors. When I think about that, it reminds me of those patients in the hospital who are there not just for one problem, but for a whole set of problems. And those are the times when I see the nurses just shake their heads. They feel so badly for those patients because there is so little hope. Because if you were to try to work on this one thing over here and really go after that, you've got consequences for this over here. And if you work on that, you've got consequences for this. It's just a nasty set of things. And when we talk about spiritual problems and the sins of control, the full Bible picture is kind of like that but it's actually really, really hopeful. See, from the world's perspective, it's primarily just nurture and biology. Well, what can you do about the way you were raised? Pay a therapist. They'll help you, I guess. But but you can't change it, right? You can try to change how you think about it or change how it affected you or something, but you can't change it. What can you do about your genetics? I am baffled by all these headlines that it's not that what they're saying is not true. It's just that they're trying to suggest that there's some hope in this. To be really blunt, the only hope I see in a lot of this is that we're going to abort more babies as we develop more ability to detect which tendencies babies are going to have. They're in the womb. 
I'm not trying to just hype that or something. But how does your genetic predisposition help you? And if I tell you that the explanation for your drug addiction is that it is a disease just like cancer, how, what did I just do for you? What are you going to do? Wait and see if they come up with chemotherapy for drug addiction? Or will burn the drug addiction out of you? Uh, maybe someday science will come up with a pill that cures you of your gambling? There's not any hope in those things. Those are not roads that take us toward anything positive. But if the answer is this full biblical picture of nurture, body, sin, Satan, human heart, there might be some hope. We started this morning with the question, does God understand? And I want us to finally answer that in a few ways, but first by saying, God understands better than any of us can ever understand. Because he created us. God understands you better than you understand you. And that to me is tremendously comforting because I do not understand me very well. You feel that way? Are you confusing to yourself? <laughs> God is not confused by you. He gets you one of the realities in the hospital is the struggle to diagnose. A doctor is so handcuffed. Handcuffed by the tests he has available, the accuracy of those tests, the testimony of the patient about what he's feeling or has experienced. So much diagnosing depends on what the patient says and how trustworthy is that? Oftentimes there are other tests that could be done but they are very risky or they're very invasive and you have to try to decide how far do we go. A doctor just can't possibly get hold of all the information he wishes he could get before he comes up with a diagnosis. God has no such limits. He understands the tiniest nuance of your life. We sometimes joke about, well, some of us especially joke about how Jesus said that the very hairs of your head are numbered. But, but if you apply that to this vexing question about the sins of control. Why do we so easily reach a point where we lose control? Who can diagnose that? Who can understand the incredibly complex interweaving of nurture, body, sin, Satan, heart? God can. He understands it perfectly for each individual. He's the physician who can diagnose perfectly. Let's take our illustration another step further then. One of the heartbreaking things in modern medicine is that there are is that our ability to diagnose has outpaced our ability to discover cures. And so we have many things that we can diagnose, but we can't really do anything about. We can help you manage, but we can't cure it. And so sometimes a doctor can make a brilliant diagnosis, a very perceptive, maybe it's a very unusual disease, very hard to diagnose, and he nails it and then can't do anything about it except tell you it's what you've got. <laughs> what about God? He can diagnose perfectly, but can he do more? Does he have the cures? Can he prescribe what is needed? But we can go even further because we've been looking at this from the perspective of God as creator. The creator can understand and diagnose and prescribe because he's the creator but what if we add the perspective of God as man? What if we remember that God came in human flesh and that Jesus was tempted in all things as we are yet without sin? Yeah, somebody could say Jesus never sinned, so he never experienced the slavery of sin or the bondage of addictions. Yes, but he experienced all of the tormenting lashings of sin's temptations. And God assures us that because Jesus himself was tempted as we are, he can sympathize with our weaknesses and he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. And so we end up with this beautiful trio of truths about Jesus. The creator understands, and the Bible describes Jesus as the one who created all things. So Jesus, the creator, is the perfect physician to diagnose and to prescribe. The creator Jesus understands, but also Jesus the man came 
and walk the path of every sort of human temptation. And so he is a brother. That's what Hebrews 2 calls him. He had to be made like his brethren, it says, in all things. He is a brother who can sympathize and come to our aid. The man Christ Jesus understands. But then those truths, Jesus the creator understands, Jesus the man understands, need to be joined together with the truth from last week. Jesus is Lord. The creator God and the man Christ Jesus who understands is also the risen Lord who says to people who are struggling with the sins of control, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You're going to find rest for your souls. My yoke's easy. My burden's light. Come to me. As I went to sleep last night, I was listening to that simple little song. Some of you probably heard it. Sweet Jesus. Sweet Jesus, my Savior, you are my faithful friend. You made me. You know me. And you see my every sin. That's a sweet thing, huh? Not just an embarrassing thing, not just a scary thing, not just a humbling thing. It's a sweet thing. You made me. You know me. Sweet Jesus, my shelter, you are my faithful friend. The refuge that I run to when my world comes closing in. Sweet Jesus, my shepherd, You are my faithful friend. You hold me. You lead me. I'll follow till the end. That's right. When creator Jesus who understands, the man Christ Jesus who understands, the Lord Jesus who understands, when he says, come to me, what we say is, I'll follow. When the sins of control overwhelm you and it's a nasty mixture of nurture and body and sin and Satan in your own heart, what do you do? How do you even begin to understand? Jesus understands. And so when you don't understand, simplify things down to one clear starting point. Seek Jesus. Follow Jesus. Come to the Lord Jesus. And so the question this morning is, are you coming There may be a thousand things in your life that are so complicated. And if we start talking about body and if we start talking about addictions and if we start talking about our past and all these things and temptations, boy, you know, in counseling, it can get so confusing. You feel like you could have eight-hour counseling sessions talking through everything. And when it's all so overwhelming and confusing, there is this one basic question. Jesus said, come, are you coming? Are you seeking? Are you following? Because he does understand way better than you do. He's the one you want to be following. He's the one you want to do the diagnosing. He's the one you want to do the prescribing. He's the one you want to do the curing. Are you coming? If you're not coming to Jesus, you're just at the mercy of your sin. Let's pray. Father, I fear that these things seem distant and remote to a person who feels out of control. And I pray that by your grace, you might change that. Jesus might not seem distant and remote to every one of us. Draw us close to Jesus. May we have a compelling hope that Jesus could help me. God, help us stop saying, it doesn't matter, it doesn't help if I pray, it doesn't help if I read my Bible, nothing changes. Change that, Lord, in our hearts. Make Jesus exciting for us. Give us hope that Jesus could do something if we would seek him. Turn our hearts to follow the call of Jesus. Come to me.
We are weary and heavy laden, Lord. Our sin is beating us up. Help us follow. Help us come to Jesus. I pray in his name. Amen.